Let me ask you a couple of questions. If I were to ask you, what would you call or what do you call a carbonated beverage? Lots of sugar. Um, it comes in a can a lot of times. What would you call that? Just in general, not a, not a brand name or anything like that. But what would you call something like that? Hopefully you said pop. If you said soda, then you may be a communist. But uh, we'll dig into that a little later. But hopefully you said pop, right? Because that's the appropriate name for something like that. Okay, moving on. What's an, uh, What's something you would say to somebody who sneezes? And you hear somebody sneeze, would you say, God bless you, gesundheit, uh, stop sneezing on me? What is it that you would say to that person? Uh, one more. Have you ever been to a tractor pull? And have you ever participated in a tractor pull or even just gone to watch one? And Or are you wondering, what on earth is a tractor pull and why would they be doing that? These are all things that could be related to culture. Right. All examples of different cultures, you know, what we call something, how we respond to somebody when they sneeze, whether or not you enjoy tractor pulls are all indicative of a particular culture in a lot of ways. Right. So um, culture is something that is so critically important to the area of communication. And, uh, and we want to discuss that and explore that. But it's also something that is oftentimes misunderstood. So we want to explore the roots of culture and then how it, it impacts communication as a result. So first of all, let's define culture. To be clear, culture is the learned and shared set of symbols, language, values, and norms used to distinguish one group of people from another. So there are a couple of important things here. We're going to break this definition down a little bit, but I want you to get that seared in your memory. The learned and shared set of symbols, language, values, and norms used to distinguish one group of people from another. So to start with, we need to, to clarify that culture is learned and shared. Culture is not something that is is genetically defined. It's not something you're born with or born into. Culture is something that is taught. Um, our, we are, we learned our culture. We learned our culture uh, from uh, our family, from our community, from our friends, from you know all the the societal norms of wherever we live, and and then we share those as well with with our family, with our community, with the, the people around us. Um, that uh, the culture is something though that is learned and shared. It is not a genetic predisposition, not something handed down um, through DNA or anything like that. It is something that is learned and shared. And what is it that we are learning and sharing? It's these components of culture that, I, that we mentioned in that definition, uh, starting with um, symbols. So, for example, if we just take uh, American culture, for example, okay, we're just going to look at American culture, some of the common um, things that typify American culture. And as far as symbols that represent America or that are important in American culture, first we have the flag. It's tremendously important. It represents a lot of ideas for different people. Uh, and, I mean, in truth, it's just a, it's some fabric, right? That's colored in a particular way and in a particular pattern, but, but it represents so much more that it carries uh, so much more in terms of symbolism um, for those of us who share in, in that American culture. It's a really important symbol. Another symbol is baseball, the idea of baseball, or sometimes football, right? But, but baseball's long been America's pastime. And, and so baseball is something that is, that is prototypically American and, uh, and something that we um, cling to as, you know, representing America. And then apple pie. And what's better than apple pie? But baseball and the flag as well, right? So American is apple pie, American is baseball, American is the flag. So these are all symbols that represent uh, not only just the United States as a country, but represent our values, represent things that are important to us, represent uh, our lifestyle and so forth. Right? So these are symbols that would be important to us in American culture. As far as a language, if we were looking at American culture, primarily is English, although we know that a variety of languages are spoken all across the country um, because we have people from all over the world that come to, to reside here in, in the United States. But, uh, but our primary language here in the United States, if not officially, but effectively is English. So we share that language. We also share a variety of values, things that, uh, that we uh, again, if, even if we don't uh, demonstrate them perfectly in the United States, they're things we aspire to, right? These values that we cling to, that we, that we say are American. This is what defines the United States and defines Americans. Things like liberty, freedom, and independence, right? Those are values, the things that we value greatly here in the United States. So liberty, or freedom, and our independence. Um, we value the idea of justice, right? 
theoretically equal justice right? and in equity injustice and justice is blind but but we we you know value a a, a fair shake in court and and you know a, a jury of our peers and and a fair judicial process and we value equality um, and again we this is something we are aspiring to still. I think there's a lot of arguments we made that we are not a society of equality and there's, that, that, that's a fair argument, but it's something that we value. Something that we aspire to is equality and, and independence and freedom based on, not on religion or gender, on, on race or creed or nationality and things, but that, um, that we value a, a fair and equitable shot of, of opportunity for everyone. Uh, there are also norms here in the United States, just like there are in any other culture. Um, there, there are things that we consider to be norms or typical behaviors or, or uh, you know, standard ways of doing things. Um, so, for example, one norm in the United States is that we eat meat, and specifically we eat meat typically that comes from either cows or pigs. That's our primary source of meat. I mean, there are others, right? There's, we eat different kinds of meat, but by and large, the vast majority of meat, and we are a meat-eating culture, and the vast majority of that meat comes from cows and pigs. Um, we also drive on the right-hand side of the road. Uh, not everywhere in the world does that, but in our country, the norm is that we drive on the right-hand side of the road. Uh, we also live t a lot of times in single-family homes um, with larger yards than other places in the world, where space is more of a consideration, so families might live in an apartment or a flat. We have, you know, much more of our citizenry, citizenry lives in, or our population lives in single-family homes with a, a decent-sized yard attached to it. That's sort of the norm for a neighborhood in the United States as well. So, uh, again, those are just examples of what would make some of the things that would define American culture. But every country, every organization, every community has its own culture. Every family has their own culture that we could point to as well. Um, different symbols, language, values, and norms. And so, for example, symbols could be anything that's representative of and important to that culture. Um, in, uh, you know, if you were in a, in a motorcycle club, it would be the, maybe the colors on the vest, right? If you were um, I used to play darts competitively and, and some are some, you know, it was uh, an important status symbol to have a nice case for your darts. That's how people knew if you were serious or not. Yeah. That, that case uh, was, was an important symbol uh, or work. It may be who gets to carry the radio or the clipboard or whatever uh, that might be symbolic for you in your workplace. Um, Language is also different for every culture. And again, let's just say that you're in the United States and so you speak English. Let's say your company, the primary language of your company is English, but then every company is going to have its own little jargon, right? The la different language that they use in terms of jargon, in terms of acronyms and things like that. So every culture is going to be different regarding language in that way. Uh, organizations and groups will have different values and sp espouse different values, and they'll have different norms, different ways of doing things. And so uh, every culture is defined by these four things and has its own set of symbols, language, values, and norms. So we tend to think of culture, though, as as kind of this one big thing, that, that we are part of one culture, like I'm American, and that's my culture, right? So that, that's it. But that's not really nearly specific enough. We, we all have a, a series and a, a set of co-cultures, really, that exist within us. Um, so I am an American. I'm also a Midwesterner. I'm from Indiana. I'm from a small town. I play darts. I love music. Specifically, I love hard rock and heavy metal music. And I love um, uh, reading. And I love um, doing different things like that. So uh, those are all different co-cultures for me. And, and they set me apart from other people. They distinguish me from other people from that collection of of co-cultures that I have, right? So we are not just one culture. We are a set of co-cultures, and we all have a bunch of different co-cultures. And, and we can demonstrate this, too, by looking at the world, for example. And we tend to say, you know, we look at the world, the United States is different than the rest of the world in many ways, right? Our, again, those things we just went through, the symbols, language, values, and norms tend to be a slightly different, maybe, maybe very different, and maybe just a little bit different than depending on where in the world you're talking about. But we're different. So the United States has its own culture, right? We have this culture, American culture. And that makes sense. And that's true. 
But that doesn't, you know, come nearly close enough to narrowing it down enough, though, right? I mean, we, we do have an American culture as opposed to other countries, but still within that, we have different regions of the United States, different areas. Uh, and even if uh, something as simple as, as I mentioned before, if you're in a part of the country that, that properly calls those kinds of carbonated beverages pop, then you're part of that culture. But if you mistakenly call it soda, then you aren't part of a totally different culture, right? Um, th and that's a cultural thing. Or, you know, the tractor pull culture, if you're part of that, then, you know, that's that's prevalent in, in uh, one part of the country, probably not so much in other parts, right? and, and so forth. You know, I'm from, I'm from Indiana. There aren't a lot of surfing opportunities, for example, in Indiana. So uh, surfing is not as much of a culture here in Indiana as would be in some place where you live on the coast and have the opportunity to do that more. So, um, so different regions of the United States, and you can get even more specific and talk about how the states have their own culture and how communities, one community to the next has its own culture and so forth. You have a different culture than your neighbor and it gets even more and more specific. And the truth is that each of us, if we think about what our interests are, what our activities are, our hobbies, each of those represents a culture. And probably a culture within that culture. Again, I love music and I specifically love the hard rock, heavy metal, classic rock, those types of music. Um, anything with a hard driving guitar. And so that's a different culture within music, right? Um, so that's a co-culture within a co-culture within a co-culture, so to speak. So, um, so we can get more and more specific with this, right? So we all have these different co-cultures. Uh, and what that does though is again, cultures help us distinguish one group of people from another. So we use this to distinguish one group of people from another, not, and I need to be clear on this, not in a sense of better or worse or right or wrong, but just as different to distinguish them as different uh, from one group to another. When we do this, when we, when we have our different co-cultures, when we think about our co-cultures, it creates what we call in-groups and out-groups. And very simply, in-groups and out-groups have to do with who we would call us and who we would call them. And so in groups for me are things that I mentioned, um, you know, hard rock music is an in group for me. Um, darts are an in group for me. Being a band parent is an in group for me or has been over the years when our kids were in band. Um, those are, those are groups that I would all refer to as us because I'm a part of that group. So that's an us group for me, which makes it an in group for me. Right? Other groups, right? People who, you know, a group that enjoys, um, country music isn't really my thing. Some of it's okay, but it's not really my thing. So people enjoy country music. That's sort of a them thing for me. That's a they or them. And, and that's an out group for me. It's not something that I'm interested in. As I mentioned, surfing, I don't surf. I've never been surfing. Don't, wouldn't know the first thing about it. That's an out group for me. Again, not that there's anything wrong with any of that. It's just, you know, when we talk about us or them, we're breaking it down into in groups and out groups. In groups are those co-cultures to which we belong. Out groups are other co-cultures to which we do not belong. Okay. So culture again, then just defines, helps us define and distinguish one group from another. Okay. So culture is the learned and shared set of symbols, language, values, and norms that help us to distinguish one group from another. That's how we define culture very specifically. Okay. I want to take a minute to dispel some myths about culture and to talk about the ways we don't define culture. So if we're talking about culture being undefined, things that are not true about culture, culture is not a matter of ethnicity, race, or nationality. Um, as we've talked about in great detail, culture is something that is learned and shared. You don't learn ethnicity, race, and nationality. Those are things that are, you know, passed down through DNA, genetics, or based on where you were born, things you have no choice over. And, and so you're not learning and sharing those things. Those are things that are imparted in different ways. So culture explicitly is not ethnicity, race, or nationality. Now, having said that, however, it's important to note that, um, even though they are not ethnicity, race, or nationality, it is um, possible that, um, uh, that culture follows those things very carefully or very closely, follows behind those things, right? Um, closely at times, because you tend to be around people who of a similar ethnicity, race, or nationality. And so, of course, those are the people who are teaching you and sharing 
things about culture with you. In fact, it's so common when, when, you know, for example, people come to the United States, it's not at all uncommon. In fact, it's very common for people to um, kind of congregate with people uh, who come from a similar background, who share that ethnicity, race, or nationality, um, to the extent that, you know, if we, when we look at places like New York City, and if we look specifically at the highlighted portion of the map here of New York City in this, this lower section here, um, we see that, that it's so prevalent that you, you end up with neighborhoods called Chinatown, Little Italy, Little India, places like that where, where those congregations of people who come from those similar cultures have gathered. And it's not, their culture is not defined explicitly by their ethnicity, their race, or their nationality. But it is uh, does trail their culture does trail those things because people you know share things with the people who are around them and and they learn things from people who are around them so um, you do have that that sort of connection but it's not explicitly culture right so culture is not ethnicity race and nationality although it can um, very tightly trail those things and be connected to those things in in some way. Uh, um, Culture is also different from this idea of ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism has to do with the belief that your culture is inherently superior to another culture or to other cultures, period. Um, and so, as, as we mentioned earlier, culture is not about better or worse, right or wrong. It's just about different. Different cultures are different, and that's the end of it. It's not that they're better or worse. But ethnocentrism does take that next step and say that, well, our culture is superior. Our culture is obviously better. The culture that I belong to is, you know, objectively superior to yours. And that's an issue we don't want to fall into. Um, and it does happen quite, just, just like it does everywhere else in the world. It does happen in the United States where people will oftentimes look at the world and say, well, obviously the United States is the best. America is the best. So everybody else is just kind of here to serve us and to supplement our needs. And why don't they want to be more like us? But, um, so we have this ethnocentric view that can come out in Americans at times. And, 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 uh, and we want to be cautious to avoid that and not think of other cultures as better or worse, but just different. Uh, and, and one of the more prevalent examples of this, though, is when we look at the map, for example, this is probably a map that you grew up with in your classrooms and things. It's called the Mercator projection map. It was developed a long time ago and is a very ethnocentric uh, representation of the world. Um, and this map it was created by you know, Europeans, basically. And so Europe takes not only the central place in the world and the central place of the map, but it's also disproportionately large to where it is in actuality. Uh, so the map we've been looking at probably our entire lives is not actually accurate. And we know now, obviously, we have satellite technology and things. It's very easy to, to check this, but the Mercator map represents an ethnocentric view, a very Eurocentric view of the world, um, as opposed to uh, the, one of the newer versions of, of a map. It's called the Gulp or uh, yeah, the Gulp Peters projection map. And uh, so it looks like this, though, where things are in their proper proportions. As you can see, Europe is still in the center, but it's, it's much smaller than it was in the Mercator projection map, as is North America. Um, Africa is much larger than it was represented in the Mercator map, as is South America. And just by comparison, for example, here you have the, the two laid on top of one another. The blue is the Gall Peters map, the more accurate um, uh, proportion uh, of the world uh, that that map represents. And then the yellow is the Mercator. You can see how disproportionate it is in terms of the size of the different places. And we could get into the idea that, that not only is Europe in the center of the world, but uh, the westernized, quote unquote, westernized societies are on the top as opposed to the bottom. And so that may place people psychologically at a, at a belief that those uh, those places on the bottom aren't as important or they, they're they're beneath the other places. So some people would say, well, not only we need the Gall Peters projection map, but we need to turn it upside down. How does that you know, affect your brain thinking about the world that way? In order to provide some um, social equality for people who live in those other parts of the world um, and avoid that ethnocentric uh, view. But that's a discussion, probably a longer discussion for a different day. But just to give you an idea of how um, entrenched these things can become in our societies. So quickly, I want to take a look at some of the ways that culture can affect communication, some of the different ways. And these are broad strokes, and, and I'm just going to kind of push through these a little bit. But uh, um, the first is that uh, culture can affect communication in the way that we view our place in it, in a sense, right? Individual versus group mentality. Are we in a society like the United States that values individual achievement, that values individual contribution, individual success, individual pursuit of opportunity? Or are we in a part of the world that, that values more that group 
cohesiveness, um, the group stability, and don't upset the fruit basket type mentality. Right? Um, again, neither one is better or worse. They both have different um, pros and cons associated with them, but uh, but there is a very different mentality in different parts of the world. Here, it's what we call individualistic versus collectivistic um, uh, cultures, and the United States is very much an individualistic culture. We also have different um, methods for paying attention to context, or different levels to which we pay attention to context um, in communicating specifically. So in the United States, we are what's called a low context culture, meaning we rely heavily on the literal words that are used, right? So a yes is yes, a no is no, uh, we don't beat around the bush, right? you know, as much things like that. We, we just take people at their word and expect people to express themselves accurately in that way. And other cultures that would be considered really rude to, to be so forthright and to be so blunt. Um, so they, they do beat around the bush a little more and soften things up a little bit. Um, and they're what's called high context cultures. They pay attention more to nonverbals and the way that this is going to affect the person's uh, quote unquote face. Right. And, uh, and and so that attention to context, whether it's a low or high context culture is different in different parts of the world and in different cultures. There's also this deference to power or th authority. Um, in the United States, again, this is a, what's called a low power distance culture. We are a low power distance culture, meaning that we may have respect for that, that position, that the authority of that position. For example, we may have regard for the person who's the president of the United States, but that doesn't mean that, that, that we totally feel like we're beneath them or that they're somehow better than us inherently, or that we couldn't just talk to them as a person. Um, whereas people in high power distance cultures may feel that way, may feel like these, this person is above me in society, so I'm not really even allowed to talk to them or I have to show them a greater regard or respect just because of their place in society. Um, we don't really have that as much here in the United States. We have that low power distance culture where everybody's kind of equal and you can get there if you can, if you can get there. You can achieve it if you can, but, uh, um, but it's not that way everywhere. This uh, comfort with ambiguity. Um, what we call uncertainty avoidance. Um, in the United States, we are not very comfortable with ambiguity. We like clarity. We like um, precision in our language, in our communication. Um, other cultures, as I've said, are more ambiguous. They are they leave more uncertain, and and they're comfortable with that. Um, and they they don't necessarily avoid that uncertainty like we do. We like to have again that clarity, that clarification. Here in the, in the United States, we are we are very low on the scale of uncertainty avoidance. Um, Achievement versus nurturing. Um, what does the society prize? What do they kind of preach, so to speak, to the, their, uh, the the people that are part of that culture, part of that society? In the United States, again, we're very achievement-oriented, individualistic, achievement-oriented, as opposed to nurturing um, and, and allowing um, people to kind of find their own way. We, we push achievement here. And then our view of time, just the way that we treat time and the way that we view time. In the United States, we're what's called a monochronic culture, meaning we, we see time as a very specific, um, specifically measured quantitative type of thing. Time is money. Time is a resource. We start meetings on time. We end them on time. We don't go over. You can't be late. That sends a signal, right? In other cultures, it's just not viewed that way. There's a much more fluid view of time. They're what's called polychronic and uh, have just a different view and relationship with time. I mean, there's the same amount of hours in the day, but they just view it differently, have a different perspective on on what that represents, I guess. So, um, just some major ways. These are just some of the significant ways that culture impacts communication. But the truth is that culture is, is a part of every communication experience, every communication scenario. Uh, it, it's really this undercurrent and it infuses everything. And, and um, so um, culture is just a really critical aspect of communication. If we're going to be effective communicators, period, then we need to also really be effective intercultural communicators. So uh, if you have any questions about culture and communication, I hope that you'll bring those to me via email and let me know, and I'm happy to discuss it with you in that way. And in the meantime, I hope that you will have a renewed understanding or, or an appreciation for the impact and the, the role of culture in communication and the, the um, attention that should be paid uh, to culture as an aspect of communication as we uh, engage with others.